It's been nearly six years since Tim Cook took over for Apple's iconic co-founder, Steve Jobs, and each year, the company becomes more Cook's own. He's unveiled the Apple Watch and Apple Music. He pulled off the largest acquisition in Apple's history, buying Beats. He's taken on issues like the environment, philanthropy, equality, and education. He stood up to President Obama on user privacy and maintains a dialogue with President Trump despite their disagreement on climate change. Now, as iPhone sales plateau, questions remain about where the big innovation at Apple is going to come from. We sat down with Cook at Apple's annual developers conference as he stakes out new territory for the company's future, from TV to cars and Apple's first new product category in years, a smart speaker called HomePod, a direct challenge to Amazon and Google. On this edition of Bloomberg Studio 1.0, Apple CEO Tim Cook. Tim, thank you so much for joining us. It's, it's really a pleasure to be it's here. It's great to see you again and, and unbelievable to be here, obviously. Let's start with the new smart speaker. Yeah. Why should people buy HomePod over Amazon Echo or Google Home at this price? You know, what we've tried to do is build something that is a breakthrough speaker first. And so uh, music is deep in our DNA, you know, dating back from iTunes and and iPod, and so we wanted something that number one sounded unbelievable, and and of course it does a lot of other things, right? And and all those are important as well, but we wanted a really high quality audio experience as well. You're very focused on how this could reinvent music in the home. Yeah. What about these other things? Will I be able to make a phone call, call a car, order groceries? There's a lot of things you can do with it. Uh, you know, one of the advantages that we have is that uh, there's a lot of things that, that Siri knows how to do from the, from the phone. And so uh, we'll start with a, a patch of those. And then you can bet that there's a nice, nice follow-on activity there as well. So let's talk about e-commerce. E-commerce is very important to these devices. I can order paper towels on my Amazon Echo. Does this tell us something about Apple's aspirations in retail? No, I wouldn't read anything to it in uh, that regard. I, wh what I would read into it is uh, Apple's a company that deeply cares about music and wants to deliver a great audio experience in the home. We feel like we reinvented it at, in the portable player area and we think we can reinvent it in the home as well. And we know that people want a speaker now to do more than that and, and obviously we want a speaker to do more than that. And, and so we're sort of combining what has been thought of to be two distinctly different things till now. How long have you been working on this? Multiple years. And so if you, the underlying technology in here is uh, uh, something to behold. And uh, to get the experience that we wanted at the quality we wanted, you know, like, like Apple products in, in general take multiple years to do, starting from the core technology and then building up to the product. You have people out there saying, finally, what took so long? Y you know, uh, for, for us, it's never been about being first to anything. You, if you think back, uh, we didn't have the first MP3 player. We didn't have the first smartphone. We didn't have the first tablet. There was a tablet shipping a decade before. Very few people used it. Uh, arguably, we shipped the first modern MP3 player, the first modern smartphone, the first modern tablet, but we weren't first in any of those. And so for us, it's not about being first. It's about being the best. It's the 10th anniversary of the iPhone. You've unveiled the new iOS, iOS 11. What does that tell us about what's next? I can tell you that iOS 11 is unbelievable. Uh, and both for iPhone and for iPad. I mean, there's incredible things in it from peer-to-peer uh, -peer payments. Uh, I, it's the biggest iPad release ever. And an area that I have uh, great personal excitement, I, I'm excited about all of it, but I'm incredibly excited about AR. And uh, as we get this developer release out in the hands of the developers, uh, we'll have the largest augmented reality platform in the world. You talked a lot about AR and VR with regards to developers, but what about consumers? When will consumers see an Apple AR product? You know, with a core technology uh, and as a platform owner, the, the first thing, and uh, arguably in some ways the most important, is to build the foundation. 
And then from that foundation, you can do many things off of it, but first you have to have a really solid foundation. Peter Thiel said that he believes that innovation in smartphones is over. Are the days of quantum leaps in smartphone innovation over, or are there more quantum leaps to come? Uh, you, you know, I don't agree with that view at all. The things that drive quantum leaps is the core technology. And when I think about all of the things that are going to change from a core technology point of view in the future, uh, I think we're just getting started. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm, I'm incredibly excited. And, and clearly there's nothing that uh, I think virtually anybody would say uh, is going to replace a smartphone anytime yeah. soon. And uh, you know, as time has gone on, the smartphone has become more important to people's lives. Uh, when it started, the phone call was still a uh, dominant reason for having it. Now, if you look at what people are doing on smartphones, it's a minor piece of what a phone is now. And, and so when I look at that and the sort of the, uh, the health uh, kit and what that's done in terms of getting people's health data on, CarPlay, the use of it in the car, I'm controlling all of my house with mm -hmm. Siri using the iPhone. And so I think about all of these things, the usage of it is now you're, it's something you just don't leave home without your iPhone. And uh, so, no, I think it's in the early stages still. I, I don't see it in that light at all. Controlling your home with your devices is still a fairly niche behavior. When do you see that becoming more mainstream? I think it's going to become uh, more mainstream this year, honestly, because we, we built it into iOS 10. And after that, you saw uh, more and more accessories coming to the market that were HomeKit enabled. And it's super easy to set up. We just made it easier for accessory vendors to be compatible with HomeKit because you now can uh, use software encryption. You don't have to, to actually have hardware encryption to go. Uh, so I think that also unleashes even more accessory guys to join. And I think people are increasingly going to want to automate different parts of their home. I wouldn't live without it at this point, right? It's one of those things that you go, wow, well, how could I ever have done that in a different manner? In the past, you said the iPad is the clearest expression for our vision of the future of personal computing. Mac sales are holding steady. iPad sales continue to fall. Why is that? Well, you know, we, we make uh, both, and I'm happy with uh, whatever people choose to buy. Some people uh, will only buy a Mac, some people only buy an iPad, and, and many of us want both, honestly. And uh, so what we've tried to do with the iPad is bring even more productivity features to it. I think a lot of people that may be buying PCs or something may look at this and decide they'd rather have an iPad Pro, and, and that's great. I think people that have an iPad will, will want to upgrade. And, uh, but the Mac remains very important to us. And so I see it as both of them are computing devices. And uh, I, we're going to keep investing in both because we think both have a great future. One of the reasons that iPad on the surface, you know, just look at the numbers, you go, oh, the units are going down. Keep, keep in mind that uh, the iPad mini came out at a point in time that smartphones were fairly small. People had three and a half inch, maybe four inch kind of screens on their smartphone. And so one of the things you're seeing is a natural move to a smartphone, not taking all of that market, but taking, taking a piece of it. And obviously we're okay with that too. The seven plus has been phenomenal. We're seeing growth rates there that, are, that have shocked us. You called President Trump and urged him not to pull out of Paris. I did, yes. He didn't listen. What does that mean for your relationship with the president? You've been engaged with this White House. You called President Trump and urged him not to pull out of Paris. I did, yes. He didn't listen. What does that mean for your relationship with the president? Well, I think actually, uh, I would say it a little different. I think he did listen to me. I, he didn't decide what I wanted him to decide. And uh, I think he decided uh, wrong. I think it's not good, not in the best interest of the United States what he decided. But in terms of, you know, the, the way that I look at this thing and do you, 
do you interact with politicians or do you not? Um, my, my view is that first and foremost, things are about uh, can you help your country? And if you can help your country and you do that by interacting, then you do it. That, that country eclipses politics. Uh, and, and so, y you know, if, um, if there's something that we can work together that uh, helps people in the United States, then of course we would do it. You have other people that are leaving the table, though, like Bob Iger, like Elon Musk. Is the president jeopardizing his relationship with one of his key constituencies, the business community? I would differentiate leaving a council and advising in a way that you think can help our country. I think the uh, first one is a judgment call that people make. Uh, I didn't join a council, and so it's not a decision I had to make, but, but I understand both sides of that. Uh, but, but advising on something that you believe will help America, I think is a, is a, is a requirement as a CEO. You, you definitely do that. And, you know, if, honestly, if I get the chance to uh, uh, go pitch the uh, Paris Agreement again, I'm going to do it again because I think it's very important that we engage to fight climate change on a, on a global basis. This isn't something where uh, you can solve it country by country. It requires a, a global action, you know. Emissions created in one country affect another. And uh, so, uh, you know, it's something that we feel very strongly about. And uh, I wanted to do every single thing that we could do to, um, to, to tell how important it was to, to stay in the agreement. And, and unfortunately, uh, he decided something different. Why didn't you join a council? Why didn't I? Because uh, two reasons. One, uh, my primary job is being the CEO of the company. And I spend uh, the bulk of my waking hours doing that. And, and I do so willingly because I love the company and the people in it. And so traveling back east isn't something that I, that I uh, look forward to doing except when I need to do. Secondly, I don't find these uh, councils in general and committees to be terribly productive and uh, uh, but but it, it wasn't about not wanting to advise on something where I thought that um, you know we could help or we had a point of view that should be heard and so I'm doing the latter I, I can't imagine a situation where I wouldn't do the latter because I think it's in the best interest of America to do it and I am first and foremost an American. On repatriation, this yeah. is an issue that would be important to Apple and potentially important to the country. How would you like a repatriation bill to be structured? In our view, it should be a deemed repatriation. This means it should be a required tax. And so you're not asking the people uh, that have had earnings from their international uh, subsidiaries if they'd like to bring back money you're saying that uh, you must pay the government X percent now or over some period of time. Uh, and I think my, my own advice would be is that the U.S. use that money for a significant infrastructure spend in the U.S. because it creates jobs. And I think there's few people that would argue that we don't need an investment in, in America. And so that's what I think that should be done. And I think it should have been done uh, years ago. Uh, but it hasn't, and so, you know, tomorrow's good. <laughs> You've made it clear that the privacy of Apple users is of utmost importance to you, even as terror attacks continue to happen around the world. Does the new iOS strengthen user security and privacy? These terrorist attacks, first of all, uh, our heart goes out to everyone affected by them. Uh, they're horrendous and... Uh, the UK, uh, for us, we've been in the UK uh, pretty much the whole length of time for our company. And it feels like uh, they're a neighbor. We have thousands of, of, of employees there. And so our heart goes out. And so what, what do we do from uh, helping with this? Uh, we, we've done uh, 
one thing since the beginning of the app store is we curate the app store. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we don't want hate speech on there. We don't want, uh, you know, these kind of recruiting kind of things on there. And so we've tried to be very careful from the beginning about not having that stuff on there. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying we'll never make a mistake, but actually I don't know of a case where something has gotten through. We also, uh, we've been cooperating with the UK government in uh, not only in uh, law enforcement kind of matters, uh, but on, on some of the attacks, and I can't speak in detail about that, uh, but in, in cases where we have information uh, and they've gone through the lawful process, we uh, not just give it, but we, uh, you know, we do it very, very promptly. I think, I would hope uh, that they would say that, that we've, we've been cooperating well and I think, you know, that it, some valuable information. And so there's a, I think, a misunderstanding about uh, encryption doesn't mean there's no information, mm -hmm. right? In, uh, because likely metadata exists. And metadata, if you're putting together a profile, is very important. And, uh, Can we assume that Apple is always working to make encryption even stronger? The, the reality is that the cyber attacks on people and governments, and uh, I mean, it's happening left and right everywhere, these affect your safety, your security. So it's not just privacy. It's, it's not privacy versus security. It's uh, privacy and security versus security. And so we're always working to try to stay one step ahead of, of these hackers that, frankly speaking, have gone from the, the guy in the basement that's a kind of hobbyist to a sophisticated enterprise and it's, it takes all that we can do to do it, and we don't think our users uh, should have to think through all these stuff. It's not practical for people, and so we try to stand up for our users and, uh, and stay one step ahead of these guys. You said cars are an area ripe for disruption. How important is it that Apple not miss out on cars? Let's talk about the world's second biggest economy, China. Yeah. How does Apple navigate what seem to be uncertain economic and political waters there? Well, it, China, for, for us, we make all of our decisions for the long term. And so we, we're not investing for next quarter or next year. We, we're, we're thinking about many, many years out. And as I stand back and look at China, I see megatrends there that make China a incredible market. And I don't mean just a market to sell in. Uh, I also mean a market for application developers. Uh, we have uh, a million and a half application developers in China now. I'm, I'm probably closer to two million now. And so it's an incredible marketplace for, for talent and in terms of the size of the marketplace. And, uh, and so this, the, the short-term kinds of economic moves up and down, I don't, get, I don't get too excited about. How realistic is it to expect that double-digit growth for Apple can continue in China? Well, it didn't continue last year, and uh, so... Are the I, days of double-digit growth over? I think we'll do better this quarter than we have the last several. Uh, that doesn't mean that we're growing double digit or that we're going to grow. It means that it'll be better from a year over year comp than the, than the previous ones. And, and I feel pretty good about that. iPhone 7 is the most popular smartphone in China. iPhone 7 Plus is the third most popular smartphone in China. Uh, last year, our, the size of our business was almost 50 billion in greater China. And uh, so we're going we're gonna to stick at it because I, I think China is uh, a huge opportunity uh, mm -hmm. over time. How would you characterize Tim Cook's Apple versus Steve Jobs' Apple? Well, I don't think about it very much. Um, what would I say? I, I, I guess I would point out that, that Steve's DNA will always be the DNA of Apple, or, or it will be <laughs> certainly as long as I'm CEO, and I think as long as anyone is, honestly. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I think it's deeply embedded in the company and we celebrate it and uh, it should be like that, it should stay like that. Obviously, uh, things evolve over time in some other areas as they would had if he were sitting here interviewing with you today. There's clearly, I'm sure, some things, but that's probably a better question to, to ask somebody that uh, uh, worked for both of us and so <laughs> forth. You've said cars are an area ripe for disruption. How important is it that Apple not miss out on cars? I, I think there is a major disruption looming there. Uh, not only for self-driving cars, but also the electrification piece. If you've driven an all-electric car, it's, it's actually a marvelous experience. And it's a marvelous experience not to stop at the filling station or gas station, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and, and so, plus you have ride sharing on top of this, right? And so you've got kind of three vectors of change happening generally in the same time frame. And so as we look at it in uh, what we're focusing on, or what, what we've talked about focusing on publicly, is we're focusing on autonomous systems. And uh, clearly one purpose of autonomous systems is self-driving cars. There are others. Uh, and we sort of see it as the mother of all AI projects. It's probably one of the most difficult AI projects actually to, to work on. And so autonomy is something that's incredibly uh, exciting for us. And, uh, but we'll, we'll see where it takes us. We're not really saying from a product point of view what, we're, what we will do. We're, but we are being uh, straightforward that it's a core technology that we view as very important. You're working across so many different platforms, whether it's TV, the watch, the iPad, the Mac, the phone. What do you see now as your vision for the future of personal computing across well, the, all these platforms? The great thing is that the uh, same, the, it's, it's all, they're all built on the same core technology, right? But we've thought through how they're used and the experience that's needed it, to, get, uh, to get the best experience for the user in each of the cases. And so out of that came watchOS, tvOS, iOS, and macOS. We think that when you begin to merge, that uh, the risk is a lowest common denominator kind of approach, and, and, and we're staying away from that. Um, I know others that have a different view on that, but that is our view, and, and, and we are straightforward with it. Uh, and, and so with TV, uh, we wanted to give an update that Amazon was joining the TV app and, and all Apple TVs later in the year. Uh, and we're going to have more to say about what we're doing in that area later. And uh, so I'll keep you in suspense a, a while there. I think everyone will be speculating <laughs> after that very comment. We'll have to leave it there. Apple CEO Tim Cook, thank you so much. It is great to see you and spend time with you.